Hi, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for attending my dissertation defense. And uh, my topic is knowledge driven information, implicit information extraction. And my committee, Dr. Seth, uh, Dr. Basak, Dr. Rema, and joining us remotely from IBM Research, Dr. Menz. So it's a well-known fact that uh, more than 70% of the data in the world are unstructured. And the whole field of information extraction uh, try to structure, uh, extract structured information from the unstructured data. So this process adds semantics to uh, the unstructured text. For example, here, if we uh, consider, uh, if you just know that insulin is just an English word, you can't do much here. But if you get to know that it's a drug that can treat uh, diabetes, that means you uh, understand your uh, text uh, in much more, uh, with more context. So this is the, the idea of information extraction and more semantics to the unstructured data. So let's have a, but, uh, but we were uh, almost, we were exclusively doing uh, explicit information extraction. Let's have a look at on this uh, clinical, uh, the technical extractor from a clinical knot. And what we can uh, extract from this information with the current technologies, we can identify that Bob Smith is a, a person, Dr. Davis is a person, that is namely uh, name and recognition. And you can uh, assign uh, identities to the entities, like what I have uh, marked here with the blue. And that, that task is called uh, entity linking. And then we can go ahead and extract the relationship. So these are the typical things that we would perform on, uh, on a clinical or any unstructured text. However, there are these two phrases in the text that actually gives you to more information, saying that the patient did not have shortness of breath and he had a, uh, the condition called edema. And the, they were not mentioned explicitly in the text, but these phrases imply that uh, that's the scenario. So this is the problem that I'm going to uh, talk about uh, throughout my talk here, uh, how to identify such information from unstructured data. So my thesis statement is implicit factual information in unstructured text can be efficiently extracted by bridging syntactic and semantic gaps in the language and augmenting uh, information extraction techniques with uh, relevant domain knowledge. So I'll be demonstrating how, uh, this, uh, how to fill these gaps and how to incorporate domain knowledge in order to solve the problem of information, implicit information extraction. Before going to detail, so why do we, why do, why do we need to uh, ex express things in an implicit manner? It's not a random scenario, there are genuine reasons to do so. Uh, so here are like five different examples that uh, uh, we observed. Uh, so when you express sarcasm or sometimes the sentiments, you express them in an uh, implicit manner. For the, the first example here, it's a tweet and it has a negative sentiments towards or sarcasm towards uh, the movie Transformers. And there are some other entity names, if you just specify the entity names, you are not giving enough information for the, uh, the medical professional. Like uh, this example here, uh, the actual condition here uh, is called cholecystitis. And that actually means uh, you have uh, inflammation in your gallbladder. But here it says fluid adjacent to the gallbladder with gallstones, which may represent the inflammation. So this actually gives you a cause. And if you just say it's cholecystitis, you are you are not giving enough information uh, what could have caused the, uh, the, the clinical condition. And sometimes you don't need to really, you, you are more focused on emphasizing the features of the entity rather than uh, expressing the entity. So the, the third example right here, it says uh, Mason even to really a long shot, uh, long shoot uh, one week in Golden Globe. There's a difference between this and saying that boyhood won Golden Globe, right? Because you want to say that it's a 12 year long shoot, that's a very distinct feature of the uh, movie uh, that, uh, this, that distinct the, this movie from the other. So the speaker wants to emphasize this uh, in, the, in his uh, communication. And whenever you are communicating common understanding, you won't bother about spelling out everything. We do this every day. Uh, so here's an example from a clinical record again. 
and it says uh, so that's basically the relationship between the dolostron and the nausea and the person who writes this assumes that the other person who read typically a medical professional knows that dolostron is an anti nausea drug so they know how to interpret the, the sentences and in in, uh, in general writing probably on uh, journalism so you don't want to keep repeating the same thing uh, in, in let's say you are reporting a news so sometimes you refer a uh, democratic candidate to Bernie Sanders and in the same text somewhere else you, you want to repeat the same thing you may say the Vermont Center so these are genuine reasons that uh, we would want to express things in an implicit manner and this is not a very rare scenario uh, the data set that we have looked at, uh, we observe that there are between 20% to 40% things are being mentioned in an implicit manner. And not only the volume, volume there is a value for uh, this implicit information. So we have been uh, developing applications on non-structured text. Like you would use clinical uh, documents to uh, develop applications like uh, uh, co computer assisted coding and uh, secondary data analysis tasks like prediction or you use uh, social data to do semantic, uh, sorry, uh, sentiment analysis. But these applications are handicapped if you do not extract all the information that are there in the unstructured data. For example, if you say the Sandra Bullock, the space movie with Sandra Bullock is terrifying, you have a, you can identify that there's a positive mention towards, positive mention in the entity, but you don't know what the target is unless you know that, that there's a mention of gravity. So, having implicit information extracted uh, in, uh, helps this application. More, more importantly, if, if you ignore this imp uh, implicit information, that would actually adversely affect the, uh, the downstream application that we develop on top of unstructured data. So, whenever we communicate... So, uh, what do we, uh, this previous slide, uh, you have so many um, uh, implicit entities. Uh, does it mean that all the uh, benchmarks for entity extraction are missing out on this? Yeah, so if you look at the data sets that have been annotated, may it be like clinical, may it be uh, tweets, for standard data set, they don't annotate these things uh, for entity recognition task, entity linking tasks. Even though a human uh, who sets up the benchmark understands that there is an entity, they have chosen not to annotate that because they don't expect, they don't expect that the, the top, yeah. algorithms would... So uh, the, the standard benchmark that have been published around now, they are have published for entity linking. Mm -hmm. So the those things are evaluated on the uh, the explicit mention. So they don't annotate. So I haven't seen even though there are uh, such things. Uh, so they have not annotated those. Is things. it so, possible uh, for you or somebody else a little bit later on to uh, go to standard benchmark and uh, identify? percentage of entities uh, that were implicit and that they actually did not include that? So this has been done for some extent in my research because mm -hmm. uh, the clinical corpus that we have used that is for that is the the data set actually is for semi well task. So the same yeah. data set being annotated for explicit entities mm -hmm. and we took the same corpus and annotated it for the implicit entities. And what percentage was uh, missing from that? That is this one here? Yeah these are the two uh, these are two entities only. Like Just two entities? Yeah. Like these are the numbers, but there are the entities. But I think but it would be good to have all the possible entities in the corpus and you know say here's a percentage because yeah, the point is that your you know uh, importance of your problem become very clear when you find if, if indeed there are 20 or 30 or 40 percent of the entities that are simply not being recognized as a part of problem that needs to be solved, then obviously you can say you there's a huge gap that you're yeah. Doing. So uh, I would. I would assume like let's say you are annotating a clinical corpus like that and to annotate explicit entities you don't need that much of a domain knowledge like if you see shortness of breath and I can now annotate that it is a clinical entity but if you mention it in a different way you really need domain expert to work on that so doing that on a big corpus that takes a lot of effort so yeah or well, maybe 10% uh, of the car you know, yeah you can take that and yeah, yeah. I would really like so whenever we uh, communicate uh, things in an implicit manner, we assume that there is a common understanding between me and my audience. So let's say I, I state the first uh, sentence to you. So that means I assume that you understand what is what it meant by the condition called edema and what it meant by this condition called shortness of breath. 
unless you don't know that you are, you are you will not be able to encode uh, decode uh, whatever i said uh, and the, in the second example i assume that the my audience will know that uh, sandra block acted in this new space movie so unless you know this fact you're not going to decode whatever i said there right so there's a big role, uh, role in uh, the knowledge this knowledge can be of different types and some of this uh, knowledge like sub subset of this knowledge <coughs> actually been serialized in different formats uh, so here are uh, some example knowledge bases that are available out there starting from linguistic knowledge bases like framenet wernet and doublenet and some common sense knowledge and then domain uh, specific and cross domain uh, knowledge bases and these things are available <coughs> and these have been used in different applications uh, uh, in, in, in information extraction. So, uh, so this demonstrates the value of uh, the knowledge uh, to extract implicit information. And with this understanding, uh, my solution for towards extracting implicit information consists of four components. Uh, the first component acquires the relevant knowledge for a given task. And then, not that every time you get the knowledge, they are not machine readable. So we have to process that knowledge and uh, model it in a way that that solves the problem at hand. And then, once you have that, given a text, I identify whether the, the text has uh, implicit uh, uh, mention of given uh, of interest type, and then develop uh, information extraction technique to extract that. Before going into the uh, details of the approach, let me uh, define the focus of the dissertation. So you can express so many things in implicit manner. You can express your opinions, you can express your facts, you can express your uh, ideas in an implicit manner. But we are not going to address all these things in, the, in this dissertation. We are going to focus on entities and relationships. Uh, in terms of entities, uh, I worked on both uh, organized text and unorganized text because in the literature it is proven that the technique that developed for uh, organized text to extract entities does not work in unorganized text. So we worked on both scenarios and in the relationship scenario we worked on clinical analysis. So the talk will be uh, from here onwards the talk will be on these three applications and I will demonstrate how the four components that I have shown earlier are realized in these three uh, applications. The first one is entities on organized text, namely on clinical records. So, first let's have a look at uh, how the implicit entities manifest in, in clinical record. Here are a few examples. We have seen a couple of, but let's, let's have a uh, more deep look at here. So, the first example uh, has uh, implicit mention towards uh, of uh, condition policies disease. And the second one has appendicitis. And the third one has actually negated mention of shortness of breath because shortness of breath is uh, defined as labored respiration and here it says unlabored uh, respiration. So, looking at these examples, you can, you can identify that uh, you need to have a physiological, you need to have understanding about physiological observations of a particular condition and some scenarios you need to have understanding about uh, the language semantics in order to uh, understand something is negated. So that's the relevant knowledge, uh, domain knowledge uh, that we need to have. But you can imagine, whenever you are uh, replacing the entity name with the text, you can do it in multiple ways, right? There's no limit for that. So <coughs> the idea here is, how do we uh, extract such uh, phrases that can be uh, used to indicate an entity uh, from uh, from somewhere, right? So. Unified medical language system is the prominent knowledge base in medical uh, domain. It is uh, it indicates so many different health and biomedical vocabularies, uh, and uh, this knowledge base for each entity that it has uh, for majority of the, majority of the entities, it has a definition for uh, those entities. Just because it is integrating so many uh, vocabularies, it ended up with having multiple definitions for. Uh, a particular entity, these definitions are not, uh, they, they complement each other. So basically they use different terminologies to express the same idea. So these are the three different uh, definitions for the condition called softness of it. So you can see that it, 
height, it captures the diversity that you can express the same thing in a, in a different manner. And that is the knowledge that we extract for this particular task, right? So we need to have a knowledge about how the physiological observations uh, to particular entities, and this is the way that we extract. And then uh, the, for the linguistic knowledge, we went to uh, the word net, which gives me the relationship between the English terms. Okay, so as you saw, those definitions are text snippet. So they are not ready to uh, use uh, as uh, uh, for the algorithm. So what we did was we processed these uh, definitions and create something called entity model, which uh, consists of uh, entity indicators. And so you saw like there are multiple definitions for a particular entity, and each definition is processed to extract the the essence essential phases of the definition uh, to create the entity indicator. So here are the uh, two examples that we saw. And in, uh, these are the entity indicators. And you can see that the, the terms that are, are really relevant to define the entity are being extracted. And there's uh, uh, something called representative power that is being calculated with uh, measure inspired with the TFID8. And so what basically what it says is how specific, how important that term in defining the entity. So what you have is in, the entity, in an entity indicator a set of words with its representative power. And for each definition, you have that, and the collection of these entity indicators create the, the entity model. Right. So once we have that, uh, now we pass the clinical documents, and we get sentence by sentence, and look at whether uh, you have terms that indicate uh, a particular entity, but does not have the entity name. So this this sentence is some uh, example of that. However, Mr. Smith is comfortably breathing in Romania. You have the term breathing, which may indicate a shortness of breath, but you don't have the entity name there. So this will become a candidate sentence for us to have a shortness of breath. Now, once you identify such sentences, we need to now perform information extraction that ultimately tells you whether it has a, a shortness of breath, whether, whether it has positive mention or the negative mention of shortness of breath. So, this is being done uh, by comparing uh, the candidate sentence with whatever the, the models that we created about the entity. So we created the uh, models uh, of entities uh, from the knowledge and we are comparing these two. So ultimately we compare the, uh, the, the sentences with each entity indicator and calculate the similarity and this is how that's been done. So <coughs> let's say candidate sentence has four terms and an entity indicator has uh, three terms. So our task is to compare these two and try to come up with uh, how similar these two uh, things are, whether the, the meaning of the entity indicator are there in the, the candidate sentence. We use WordNet as the background knowledge to compare the, uh, compare the terms. And if there are antonyms, they are being uh, scored with minus one. Otherwise, what we do is we take the maximum similarity of uh, the term from candidate sentence, that, uh, the maximum similarity shown by the term in candidate sentence towards the, uh, the, cent uh, the terms in uh, entity indicator. And each, whatever the number that you get for at this step is uh, weighted with uh, representative power of the term. So the, the idea there is that if you have a term missing in your candidate sentence that has a very high representative power, that should be penalized, right? So if the, if the term is not that uh, uh, important, then it's okay. So that is why it's been uh, uh, weighted and then it's the normalized and this value uh, spread uh, it's between minus one to plus one. And minus one indicates negated mention of entities and the plus one is uh, uh, positive mention of entities, right? Towards the plus and towards the minus. Right. Now uh, we have a, a, a way to do the entity linking here. So let's go to the, uh, let's evaluate this work. So there is no gold standard uh, uh, to evaluate such work. Uh, so what we did was there are uh, uh, data sets uh, available that have been annotated for explicit entities. So we took uh, this uh, uh, sem uh, semi well 2014 task 7 uh, data set that is being annotated for entity uh, explicit entities and we re annotated them for ex implicit entities. And to do this, it is not possible to re annotate uh, the whole corpus. We selected a set of uh, uh, entities that we are interested in. The way that we selected was we annotated the uh, 
it's already annotated. We took the most frequent entities and asked from domain expert what kind of entities that you think can be mentioned in an implicit manner. Like they will say like chest pain, you won't find them in uh, in implicit manner. There are certain set of uh, uh, conditions that are tend to be uh, mentioned in an implicit manner. And uh, we annotated uh, 850 sentences towards uh, uh, eight entities, and this is the the data distribution. And so what we said, what this tells is that there are 93 uh, sentences with positive mention of shortness of breath, and there are 94 sentences with negative mention of shortness of breath, and the, all these are obviously uh, implicit mentions. Now, to evaluate this work, um, do you do you have a sense of the percentage of these that are implicit and explicit in this particular context? Yes. Uh, <coughs> so. My numbers, but it says it, when it says twenty percent, that means eighty percent it's explicit, and twenty percent of that entity is implicit. So that uh, the the for the demand. No, but go back, go back. The, okay, so here uh, positive annotation ninety three, negative ninety four. Mm -hmm. So there are you know one hundred and eighty plus annotations. Yeah. Uh, how many of them are explicit versus implicit? Well, these all, all, these are are all implicit, implicit, you say, right? Yeah. The question is how many um, at the same time were explicit? So, Sorry. in the in data the, set that we, uh, well, I, I, eight I, times of this. I would, I would ide ideally, I would say uh, for uh, the documents in which you found these implicit entities, how many explicit were found? That would be interesting thing to know, saying that here we went through, this is a corpus, uh, and in this particular corpus where there was an implicit entity, uh -huh. there were so many explicit. And that in those uh, documents, um, I guess you, you came up with the number around 20, right? Yeah. So that is uh, like, now it is 180. Now, whenever you see 180 occurrences of shortness of breath, you are seeing eight times of that, uh, four times four of times that. Four times of that. At, mm. uh, uh, explicit. Yeah, explicit. Mm -hmm. Discriminate in a sense, how do I annotate those? He had an example of a negative, right? Earlier? Like uh, unlabeled. So if you say respiration is unlabeled, then that's a negative mention. If you say comfortably breathing. Yeah. It's positive. Hey, I want to ask you another know. question. So that uh, data set is predominantly medical uh, oriented or yeah. is it generic? This, These are all EMR. Just yes, EMR. Okay. So. To evaluate uh, uh, this work, we implemented two baselines. Uh, one is uh, supervised baseline and, and the other one is unsupervised baseline. Uh, for the unsupervised baseline, we selected the MCS algorithm, which is the best performing unsupervised algorithm for uh, paraphrase recognition. Uh, and then the uh, SEM is initially trained, trained with uh, n-grams. And the first three rows here shows you the, uh, the results. So you can see in the, uh, the algorithm performs very well on negated uh, scenarios because we treated them negated. We know that that's very important. Uh, so we treated them uh, very well. And then uh, for the positive scenarios, you can see the SEM has slightly uh, outperformed our algorithm. So this gives us the indication that uh, the number that we generate that the semantic value has captures the semantics of positive and negative mentions, right? And we train the SVM on n graphs. So, what is there any combination of these two that does better? So, what we did was the we incorporate the the feature that we calculate towards the uh, with the uh, SVM and hand same experiment, and it gives a, a better result. So, the two. Uh, uh, Rows at the bottom shows you those results. So SVM uh, integrated with the baseline uh, unsupervised similarity measure is uh, the this row, and then SVM integrated with the similarity value that we calculate here. That is the the last row. So with this, so I said like uh, the the. So John. Yes, Pablo. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to to make a small comment here. Uh, from what I understood, what's happening in the bottom where you have SVM plus hours, mm -hmm. I think what it means is that the SVM is leveraging your algorithm yeah. to beat the unsupervised uh, version of the algorithm alone. That, 
but one sentence in your uh, slide says that SVM is manages to beat your algorithm, but it uses your algorithm to beat your algorithm, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's true. So that is what actually uh, 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 demonstrated here. So when you train the SVM, we are training SVM classifier for each entity because it's the, the n-gram, right? So you need to capture semantics of n-gram that's different for each entity. So you have to uh, train uh, SVM for each entity. So that means you have to have a label there. Now, but is there any uh, way that we can incorporate the value that we calculate independent of the, uh, the entity, right? So we calculate the similarity uh, using the definition. So if we incorporate that value, what is happening here is on your left, you have, uh, I'm showing here how the uh, the numbers change with the training data size. So with the 60% of training data, uh, the black line is uh, just my algorithm. And then the green line here is the uh, when you incorporate my algorithm value towards with the SVM. And with 60% of training data, it, uh, it matches uh, the value. And from there onwards, it can, it can go up, right? But here, it's using the, uh, the I, cement value that you calculate. Your algorithm or SVM plus your algorithm, you mean that uh, SVM that exploits uh, knowledge? Yes. Human knowledge, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I would not have called you know, SVM plus my algorithm, I would have called it new algorithm kind of thing. So, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, what this so, so tells is that you can use the, the knowledge that we uh, use to come up with the number to reduce the number of uh, label data that you need uh, or to uh, and to uh, uh, get superior performance uh, on, on a supervised crew request. So just going back to sort of core intuition, um, uh, using the knowledge and then surrounding statistical information, that's something that you have exploited using the knowledge primarily in terms of the entities yes. uh, in the knowledge base yes. is what you expected. What if you also incorporate in that some additional relationship-centric knowledge? You understand what I'm saying here? Yes. Uh, Which is an additional level of knowledge than the very basic ones plus um, statistic knowledge of SVM. Yeah. So there's a um, that line that we need to draw here whether we are doing inference or implicit, right? So the relationship, let's mm. say shortness of breath, if, we, if you're talking about relationships, like what are the drugs being taken when mm. you have shortness of breath. Mm. Mm. Now, if you give me a set of drugs and I am deriving that it's a shortness of breath, then that you are in inferencing. But, in the but, text, but, but it but is not about it, but, but, but if you, you know, if you define implicit entity recognition as something as to what a human would have, already, would have done, the human will take the entire context will not be limiting himself to just the kind of thing you're doing here. Yeah. So why do you want to handicap your... Well, I don't want to go into uh, inference uh, scenarios. Because, uh, like, inference in, in medical domain, medical diagnosis, that's something that people have studied on expert system. What I am consider is, whenever you have explicitly written, like, you have a phrase there, uh, that it has shortness of breath. You don't have to have derived from uh, medical, uh, like medications or, or other things, but it's there in the in the sense. I, I do have actually a good example here. Like, uh, yeah, here. So, this sentence right here, small fluid adjacent to gallbladder with gallstones versus small uh, fluid adjacent to gallbladder with gallstones with uh, may represent inflammation. So this is an implicit, uh, implicit measure per my definition. This is something that you will derive based on your medical knowledge, right? So if you annotate this with cholecystitis, we are using uh, that this can cause uh, uh, cholecystitis. Here it it's already mentioned. You mean it doesn't explicitly say so? Yes. Mm. This actually mentioned that mm. represent inflammation in gallbladder. Mm. So I'm I'm worried about these things. Um, and that's the, the line between inference and the, the implicit that I draw. Let's go back to
So we were here, and the next scenario is all these annotations. Uh, we ask them to give us confidence that how confident are you on your annotations. So they gave us uh, so the confidence between one and five. Low confidence meant some sentences they were not complete or they were ambiguous. That's the uh, the low confidence. Whenever they are super clear, they said yeah, I'm sure about this annotation. So we vary the the confidence uh, and uh, annotate our annotate the sentences with our algorithm. And obviously, we will expect that it will go high with the the high confidence, right? Because sentences are super clear, so I, we can do better as well. So this is the confirmation of that. Now, so we just finished uh, how to do uh, implicit entry linking on clinical uh, records like organized text. And then uh, now I'm going to talk about how uh, how they manifest in unorganized text like two eights or informal text, uh, and how to approach that problem separately. Now, let's look at uh, these are the few examples uh, in in uh, informal text. Uh, the manifestations of implicit entities in these two, two different texts are shows different characteristics. Earlier we had this manually curated definitions. Here, this entity does not have something like that. And so here, these are the four different phrases that uh, uh, people use to refer the mo the movie, movie boyhood. And you can see they use very diverse knowledge about uh, the movie boyhood, right? The first one is the director, second one is the actor, third one is a very distinct feature of the uh, movie, and the fourth one is the character of the, the movie. And not only that, there are these phrases that you use in in informal communication. They they are very time sensitive. Like space movie in two thousand thirteen, you would assume that that is uh, the gravity, and then when you, when you talk the same phrase in two thousand fifteen, it's the 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 movie Marshall. And uh, uh, the same entity can be referred with two different phrases uh, in two different time intervals based on the events that happening in the real world. So the social media is something that act, react very quickly to the uh, real world event. So you will see those things in uh, implicit in, in entity manifestations. So, okay, go back to our first uh, steps, right? So we have to acquire the knowledge, model net, and detect it, and then implement it. So the first step is uh, knowledge acquisition. Uh, as you saw, this is a very diverse knowledge that we need to have about entities. Uh, so we separate out uh, this knowledge, uh, factual knowledge and contextual knowledge. And factual knowledge is something that you can get from uh, knowledge bases. Like we use uh, DBpedia, it has a big coverage, and this is the uh, it is the uh, knowledge base that keep updated. And so what we did was we uh, collected knowledge from DBpedia by ranking the relationship towards the specific specificity of the your domain, and then. Uh, we selected uh, the top rank uh, relationships and plus we incorporate the RDF comment regardless whether it rank uh, uh, because the RDF comment is something that you get uh, text that complements the uh, other structured information in uh, DBpedia and then uh, as you saw there were uh, some topics that you won't find them in uh, uh, in factual knowledge so what those are the topics that have been associated with entities in daily communications. They are, re they are reacting to the real world uh, events. So we uh, extract uh, such knowledge from uh, tweets about the, the same entity. And then, uh, as you saw, there's a temporal uh, relevance, right? When you say, you say space movie in 2014, the most popular space movie at that point is uh, gravity. So that's why you assume it's uh, the, the movie. So in order to capture that scenario, we use uh, the views uh, that the, the Wikipedia page of the entity gets in uh, that particular time period. So, once you acquired this knowledge, uh, some of some component of this knowledge is still unstructured. Like the tweets, when, when you collect tweets about the entity, they are unstructured. And the RDFS comment uh, in factual knowledge that's unstructured. So, what we did was uh, we have to extract the phrases in uh, this uh, knowledge component. Uh, that are meaningful towards uh, the entity. So 
to do that, we created a, a dictionary of meaningful phrases. We uh, get that from uh, Wikipedia titles and the collection of Wikipedia titles and the anchor text. That is the uh, the meaningful phrases. Those are the things that humans decided oh, this phrase is uh, meaningful uh, to represent something in real world. So that is fun way to do that. And the other thing is, but even though you have these phrases, you cannot expect in uh, in, in media like Twitch to people to uh, uh, express them uh, completely, right? So there are some scenarios that you will say instead of Sandra Bullock, I love Sandra, right? So in that case, you have to capture, okay, this Sandra is uh, something very important. So to capture those scenarios, we took, uh, we used the uh, unigrams uh, uh, that does not match with the phrases and remove the stoppers. So that's the collection of uh, the knowledge comes from. Now, we have knowledge about entities that we collected from two different, three different sources. Uh, and then we model these entities uh, in a way that, that uh, reflect the topical relationship between the entities. So the movie Gravity has uh, this, uh, the, the ones on blue, they are coming from the Imperial and ones on purple, they are coming from uh, uh, Twitch. And so Sandra Bullock and the director, uh, are, yeah, we can get from uh, Gravity and these are the other topics that are being associated with Gravity in daily communication. So these are coming from uh, Twitch. And you will see whenever you are building the, the entity models, there are some topics that have been shared uh, among multiple entities, like uh, Mac Demon shared among Interstellar and uh, the Martian. So, what you see is when, when, if you say space movie with Mac Demon without any context, then I am stuck between Interstellar and uh, the Martian, right? But if you say uh, the Mars orbit mission and if you associate that with gravity, so there was this particular event that. Uh, this is mass, mass of is something that Indian Space Research Organization uh, did, and it had it had a lower budget than the gravity. That is why, so people found this very interesting, and they start talking about that. That is why this topic is associated with the gravity. Now, if you compare space movie with mass orbit mission, I have <coughs> very high confidence, high confidence that it is towards the gravity. This intuition is captured in these properties. So basically, these properties <coughs> of the nodes shows you how specific particular uh, phrase, partic uh, particular cue towards the entity. Now, now we have collected knowledge and model those uh, knowledge uh, to represent entities. The next task is, if you give me a tweet, I first need to identify that it has an implicit mention, right? So how we did, how did, how we did that was like, uh, we stream the tweets, uh, based on, let's say, I'm interested in movie, I use uh, keywords like movie and film, and stream the tweets, and then annotate them these tweets uh, for explicit entity mentions. And if you don't have explicit entity mention, then it goes to my algorithm uh, to consider whether there's a implicit entity. Okay, now, now that I know uh, uh, to identify tweets with uh, implicit entities, now I need to find out which entity is mentioned here, right? So that is the edit linking task, and which has two steps: the candidate selection and filtering, and then the dissemination task. So candidate selection will find out uh, what are the possible uh, entities among the all the entities that we know about, uh, and then the dissemination task find that one particular entity uh, that should be linked. So let's walk through an uh, example here to demonstrate how these two steps works. So let's say I have this uh, domain knowledge and then you give me this tweet, right? And what I would first look at is whether do I have any cue in my, in any, uh, any phrase that match with the tweet that you gave me. If that is the case, all the entities that link with this tweet, this uh, cues, will become candidates. So this can be a very uh, big data set, right? Because like terms like Hollywood gives you uh, so many uh, movies because all the Hollywood movies may be attached to the, the term Hollywood. So this can be a very big data set, uh, very big candidate set. So what, what, did we, what did we do was to prune it, we score each candidate, select uh, candidate to filter them out. So that this scoring is done based on the strength of the evidence that I have in the, uh, from, the, uh, from the engineering model. So as you can see, uh, uh, so basically we use uh, the, the properties that I define in the, uh, the entity model to score the candidates and then uh, find out what are the, and they reorder those candidates 
Yeah, yeah. I have a question. So, in the, in the previous example, that space movie, right? Mm-hmm. Where does that appear? Where does that appear? So, in suppose in a, in, a, in a tweet, it appeared a space movie. Yeah. So, you'll be triggered by the Q movie? Space movie. Space movie, so yeah. that appears in the knowledge graph? Yes. Like, something like, I don't have a space movie here. Yeah, see, the last uh, example, I didn't see it, and that's why I was uh, wondering. Oh, okay, okay. Here, here right. there should have been a space movie known yeah, also? Yeah, this oh. is thing. Like, you will see this kind of things. Yeah, if, if you have a space movie, it will be attached to all these three things. Okay. Which field does it come from? So, in a movie database, space movie, is it no. a description field? No. So, we collected uh, two different uh, data sources, right? DBPDA will give you a director's, actor's, such knowledge. Yeah. And then we collected tweets about the entity. And these tweets will give you those faces to you. Yeah, but then in the tweets, you are identifying uh, phrases like space movie? Yes. And how do you know these are most distinguishing phrases? Uh, yeah, that is what... Uh, is called here. So some faces like astronaut mm. that will be common to all these things, right? Mm. So that will be linked to all these things, and the specificity of that will be low. Mm. Versus uh, face like mass orbiter mission, which has very high high specific to, towards the movie gravity. Mm. So mm. these things are scored based on how many things that are that they are linked. To. Mm. So it's going n grams, right? Yeah. So. Uh, so once you have, uh, sorry, yeah, once we uh, scored the candidates and filter them out, then we now we have kind of a uh, candidates set that we can deal with. Now we goes to the now we go to the uh, the disintegration step, which <coughs> rank this uh, filtered uh, um, candidates again to find out which one is the the right one for this particular. So this has been done as a uh, rank, formulated as a ranking problem, and we learned the uh, the models to rank, which basically uh, look at features like how similar the tweets with the entity and how uh, prominent that entity among the candidates entities in that particular time period, and then uh, it uh, learn the model and then uh, rank the uh, the winner, and we'll get the uh, the top one as the. The entity that's been mentioned. Okay, so to evaluate uh, this uh, work, again we had to create our own data set, uh, which uh, which we collected in 2014 August. So what we did was we used give us like a movie and film to create a, a data set of uh, movies, and then uh, we did the same thing for book uh, using book and novel. Uh, and then when you select the uh, the tweets when you, when you stream the filter the tweets based on this keyword, what you will get is there are tweets with explicit mentions, implicit mentions, and not mentioned not mentioned at all, right? So if you uh, like, let's have a movie night today. You have that term, but there's, they are not talking about a particular movie. So that is what uh, this data set is. So what this uh, table tells you is there were like this many uh, uh, tweets with explicit mention of movies. And among these 391, 107 distinct entities, entities versus were there. And among these 207, 54 distinct entities were there. And the same reading for the, uh, the books. Now, so we collected the evaluation data set in 2014 August, right? Uh, the entity model network, basically the knowledge about entities, we collected up to 2014 uh, July. So we for, to do this ex- experiment, we cannot model all the edits, all the movies in the world, right? What we did was, we found what are those movies that have been discussed in that particular time period. We collected 15,000 uh, tweets and annotated them for explicit entities, and we found among that 15,000 of movies, there were 617 movies being discussed. So this 617 is the set of movies that we are interested in, uh, in linking. So we created the entity model network for these 617 movies, collecting knowledge from DBpedia and uh, and the tweets, and then uh, get the number of uh, views for that entity from uh, from the Wikipedia. Now, to uh, uh, and then we uh, perform our uh, linking uh, approach and found out that. Uh, these are the numbers. So candidate selection recall will tell you 
uh, I took the top 25 after the filtering I took the top 25 candidates and this number will tell you that how many times that I get the right entity in among top 25 and then this number tells you that how many times uh, once I uh, rank uh, once I run the disambiguation how many times I get that particular entity at the top position right so the the candidate selection is uh, uh, it gives us uh, around 90 percent of uh, recall and the disambiguation is around 61 percent of uh, that request now uh, remember we use two different knowledge sources and the knowledge from tweets is something that uh, the literature has not exploited uh, too much so what what we were interested in seeing that what is the contribution that uh, the topics that we extracted from daily communication contributes towards the entity linking on top of the, the factual. So to do that we created the entity model using uh, only the factual knowledge and then incorporating uh, the contextual knowledge and perform the same uh, two steps and without contextual knowledge we get 77% of recall in candidate selection and it goes to 90% mm -hmm. when you add contextual knowledge. Uh, in in movie, would and you would you call this velocity of knowledge? Velocity of knowledge. Ah, what does that mean? Like, uh, I mean, to me, I'll call it variety because people refer to the movie in a different way than uh, the way it is curated. No, but remember, he is going with the time thing and what are the recent uh, pieces. Yeah, that, so that part is kind yeah. of typically yeah, velocity. Mean. There's a velocity of data, and here velocity <coughs> of knowledge, meaning that. People, uh, if you de people who describe that that okay. movie about Mars, in different ways, uh, you know, yeah. that will be a contemporary, uh, you know, thing that will come up uh, for a small period of time while that is active and important, and then it will fade off, and then yeah, we could say that right? yeah. or the space movie in like two thousand thirteen and fifteen. Yeah. So it's a velocity, meaning the change in the knowledge, knowledge. Uh, with the temporal the element. Idea. That is what velocity of data is also, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But I think uh, I think there is an opportunity to model that much more explicitly and quantify that, mm -hmm. like uh, how that change. Yeah, how you know those particular words. And the point is that thing like the space movie, uh, how uh, the reference to that in one case is one movie, in other other time the other movie changes. That is exactly the concept of velocity yeah. or continuous semantics. In fact, the time element is implicit in what he is doing, but it's quite important. Yeah. Uh, actually, we didn't make it explicit oh, I think yet. It would be nice to show it visually right. and quantify it to some level, right. uh, as yeah. I think it's just not been done. Because if he if he changes his time window for yes. the contextual knowledge hmm. to much wider, hmm. it's going to get messed up. Yeah. But it has to be. Yeah. Done yeah. 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 So so uh, what would be a good uh, you know time frame and uh, clearly yeah. uh, will relate to content in Twitter is one thing. Uh, if I'm uh, looking at, uh, let's say, cancer research, uh, because, you know, there is a stem cell based cancer research thing, there is a blip of that kind of thing now, again, that, but the time period would be different, it would be, of course, longer and less, well, you know, the velocity would be lesser, but... Yeah, yeah. making ex time explicit is probably worth uh, investigating in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think it depends on, as you said, like, entity type, even here, like, not domain, like, cancer mm -hmm. versus movie. Like movie versus book, like mm. movie you get every Friday or something. Mm. So you have to have different yeah, velocity. Yeah. Actually, the reason I'm asking some of these questions is not that I don't know answers or something, but is that like for example, this is something that I would expect. You know, this is knowledge graph platform people would understand and, and model and exp you know see if there is an approach there. Getting back to the concept of the entity resolution, so this entity actually. Um, Understand. Right, but there, there is temporal element of that. Yes, that's yeah. the. Idea. And the context yeah, has the yeah. temporal element of yeah. that. Yeah. The similar thing as, for example, in Urban Dictionary, context would have a locational element, saying that how do you interpret this word in France versus US? That's yeah. a locational element. So, the um, just like you read harassment proposal and the context, at least in the proposal, is the most exciting and important thing. The same thing here in that. Um, People have not built narrow knowledge, which is one uh, objective we have in the project. Other thing is that this thing is variable and there is a, in the context, temporal and spatial elements and domain elements. And how do you quantify them and how do you, um, you know, 
show the value of that, uh, you know, and measure that that is the opportunity because those are things just not exploited. Given that more of the content generated is um, contextual temporal in nature, the way, you know, there is a topic, uh, you know, getting a lot of attention on Twitter for a point of time and that dies off. There is a, uh, a issue that is local importance, like today's Thailand bombings. Yeah, it's there, and that's the contextual in nature, in the location and time. And uh, there is a name of a city that I, I, I've heard of, Phuket, but I've not heard of other city at all. And now that needs to be part of my knowledge. And, you know, that came to the fore and now is part of my knowledge and I will use it next time I have. Again, you know, bringing that into the knowledge generation aspect is very important. The velocity aspect of knowledge, I like to see that concept. Okay, but can you go back one? So, disambiguation accuracy around 60% all the way across, have you taken a look mm -hmm. at the 40% that are not being... Is, is there any commonality yes. amongst the ones that are difficult to disambiguate? Yes. Uh, so I'll explain this slide and then uh, okay. because this partially answers the question Great. and then I'll explain. Uh, so these are the scenarios that we went wrong. Uh, and these are the four error types we identified. And the first one was, uh, remember we selected 617 movies. We thought that those are the uh, things that are being discussed. When we collect the contextual knowledge for those things, some of some of those movies did not have enough tweets. Like this tweet, this entity uh, just had like 40 uh, tweets, but we are collecting knowledge from 1,000 tweets per entity. So uh, this just did not give us enough knowledge uh, to model the entity. That is one reason to not uh, link this properly. And then there were these novel entities, uh, in a sense that. Uh, the deep water horizon, people will know that, okay, this movie is coming, right? But the Wikipedia page of the uh, world horizon was created in September, so we did not have, uh, we, uh, that was not in our knowledge base. And remember, we, we are doing this in time frame manner, right? So we collected uh, knowledge to July, and then uh, what happens was this, uh, the, this is a book, and it reissued in early August, and people start to discuss suddenly. But at July time frame, we did not uh, know about this entity, so we are we are not going to uh, link this. And there were some other uh, uh, tweets, very a uh, few tweets that had two implicit mentions at in the same tweet. So uh, so here you have divergent and fourteen hours pass. The formulation of the problem we uh, link only one entity per tweet. So we are missing uh, one, some of these things. Uh, yeah. So these are the reasons that. Uh, uh, that we think we went wrong. Like these are the things that we found that we went wrong. Yeah. No wait, wait. So so what what what's wrong with last one? Last one so last one is uh, this has two entities, two implicit entities. Okay, so, so you this, can't disambiguate meaningfully because no, it's, it's, I mean uh, no. the formulation of the the ranking formulation, right? You rank and take the top one. Assuming assuming that there's only one entity per, yeah, per two. Just the way he formulated. So we will yeah. we'll identify one of these things. Yeah, but in that you can deal with and give yourself the the benefit of doubt and change the metric. So I don't have a problem with that. So first one says there is an issue with uh, tweets model construction. Second one says there is an issue with Wikipedia thing, and the third one says it's not very reactive. I mean, it takes little time to grow and 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 then pick up. Right? Yeah. yeah. And the third one, I mean, humans have that problem. That's going to yeah. be very difficult right. to solve yeah. because that's that's something humans haven't solved. Yeah. Yeah. So. I have a question on that last example. How do you? Which one did it end up getting selected? Is it just the the order of mention? No. Uh, the order order of mention does not matter. Okay. So what it matters is you have these phrases, Hazel and Hazel and Augustus. Uh, so that is the one which ha which gave which gave me uh, good evidence towards the entity. So I think it's the fault of uh, fourteen hours task which uh, associated with the, that phrase. That was better evidence among the yeah things from among the phrases that matched the the knowledge base. Now, so we looked at two scenarios. Remember my diagram. We uh, looked at entities on clinical, entities on tweets. And now we are going to look at... Now this is an interesting thing, right? That um, 
there may be a very well-known movie talking about cancer uh, that may be old. Mm-hmm. And yet, uh, you know, and there will be a lot of information about that in the knowledge base. And yet, <laughs> uh, the likelihood that a person is talking about more recent one with you know, which is that is being modeled in my uh, so that the temporal element, you know, value is there in yeah. this kind of content. Like in all the sequels kind of thing that might happen, right? Oh, the I mean, you series have of series of movies, movies. Uh-huh. there will be overlap. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so let's look at uh, how relationships can manifest in in an implicit manner. So one of the best sources that you can uh, go to identify the, the implicit relationships is clinical records. So on your left, you are seeing a clinical record, which has four different sections, current diagnosis, medications, assessment and recommendations. And these are, actually this medical record is somewhat structured, but you will see big paragraphs in the in medical record. So either way, what you're seeing here is you have entities being mentioned it can be drugs, uh, diseases, symptoms, <coughs> procedures, whatever, uh, as a bulleted list, but it never link the medications with the diseases or symptoms with the diseases or procedures with the diseases. That's just the way that uh, it's been uh, written because it is something that another medical professional will uh, understand. So once, when another professional, uh, medical, uh, medical professional reads the document, he can uh, generate this graph and say, okay, this this is how these entities are related. And he can populate the relationship between entities. Now, this, this the, the relationships can exist between uh, disorders, medications, and procedures. And if you are given a knowledge base uh, of this relationship, it's trivial to establish those relationships, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, but the problem, problem that we are facing in, in medical uh, domain is that we have knowledge bases which are very rich in uh, the hierarchy of knowledge, but they lack in uh, finding, uh, populating the, uh, the domain relationships. So we, yes. Uh, you populate the relationship only by co-occurrence mostly. Only by? By co-occurrence of the entity, the entity, the entity, the entity. Here? Yeah. No. So this is something that uh, medical professional read this yeah. and say that uh, this, these two medications are for hypertension in this document. So this is not co-occurrence. This is coming from uh, medical knowledge. Oh, so it's really different. Yeah, this is the knowledge. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the idea. We approximate by UMLS in your system. Yeah. So the idea here is that uh, if we have such a knowledge base, uh, a comprehensive knowledge base, you can uh, create that uh, graph, right? The problem is we don't have that. Uh, the idea is how do we acquire this knowledge in an efficient manner, right? If you have that, you can now uh, establish the relationships, uh, implicit relations in the, in the document. So let's go through an example. Let's assume that you are given this knowledge base. Even though you are not a uh, medical professional, let's say you are given this knowledge base, right? And you are given a document which has this, these three compo- uh, diseases which I call observed disorders because I observe them in the clinical mm-hmm. record and these are the symptoms which I observe in the cell. And according to that knowledge base, I can establish these relationships. Trigger, right? But what I found was, okay, there's this con- uh, symptom called edema. I don't know about that edema in, in my knowledge base. Now I am stuck to link this, uh, this. But I assume that this should be linked to one of these things, right? Uh, now the idea is how, uh, now what you can, Namely, do is you can say, okay, uh, let me ask from a doctor whether this is related to atrial fibrillation, whether it's related to hypertension, or whether it's related to diabetes, right? But you just don't have that much of uh, availability from medical uh, uh, person. So we develop an efficient way that we filter, we small filter out which of these three, which two or which one, has the highest probability of getting linked to. So that's the whole process. Now, to do this. We are not starting from zero because there are knowledge bases that will give you hierarchical knowledge about it. Yes. So if you go to the UMLS, they, they have these two tables. With these two tables, you can create the hierarchy. And uh, there are web resources, uh, credible web resources that you can find which drugs normally treat which medication. But 
but what we did was we selected these things and called and whatever we add to the knowledge base are validated by the domain expert. Now, now we have hierarchical knowledge and we have uh, the relationship. This is how the, the knowledge base looks like. Uh, it will tell what is the hierarchy in hypertension and the hierarchy in breathing and problems and then what, uh, the relationship between those. So this is the knowledge base that we have right now. So we assume that uh, we have some, uh, we know some of these relationships. We just not, we just don't know all of those things. Now the idea is how do we find out that the relationship that we don't know. Uh, this is driven, this is done in a uh, data driven manner. So we get the, uh, the, the clinical documents, annotate them for entities because you need to find the entities first, right? We use uh, the CTEX, which is like industry uh, use uh, clinic, uh, annotation tool for uh, clinical records. And then once I identify these entities, then I can use my available knowledge to establish the relationships. But I will find, okay, some of those things I don't know. Right? So these are the things that I will go after to find out which of those uh, three things related to. As I said, naively you can uh, ask for all co-occurring disorders, but we are not going to do that. Uh, we, we are trying to leverage, like let's say you are a second year medical student, you know something about entities and uh, when, when you see such a thing, you have some, uh, even though you don't know whether this is related to these three, you know more about this symptom. In that case, you can use that knowledge to find out which one is the, the highest probability. So that's the idea that we are trying to implement here. So how it works is, let's say this is the symptom that we don't know about. And these are the five different co-occurring disorders uh, in the in the document. Even though we don't know about, uh, we don't know that these are these symptoms is linked to B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5. We know more about the symptom from our knowledge base. It, uh, it it may uh, it gives a symptom of B6 and it's a symptom of B7. Right? We just don't know whether that's related to B1, B5. And we know more about these diseases too. This is the hierarchical knowledge. The idea is that now. Given that D6 and D7 are related to S, and these are the, these are the, uh, the other diseases that are related to D6, that's the neighborhood, right? So if you see overlap between the neighborhood and the co-occurrence, your confidence goes high, right? Because these are similar to the, uh, the diseases, uh, the disease, and then uh, they are occurring in my co-occurring data, uh, data. So that tells me that D2 D2 and D4 has higher probability of getting linked to S than B1, B3 and B5, right? So this is the idea. Uh, now, what we did, uh, we eliminate all other three uh, possibilities. We stick with these two and we ask two cases. Now, if you are seeing this recurring manner, that again gives you statistical confidence about uh, uh, D2 and D4. So this is the idea we, uh, 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 implemented. Uh, now we will ask only two questions whether S related to D2 or S related to D4 from a medical expert. Hopefully he will give the, uh, he will give the, uh, some yes to one of those things and we are covering the knowledge that that's required. Now, so in order to evaluate this work, uh, we uh, uh, ran our experiments on uh, 1500 clinical medical, uh, electronic medical records, annotate them with CTEX and it we create the initial knowledge base with uh, this many disorder symptoms and again this is based on the, the frequency. And what we found was that once you uh, model the entity, model the, your knowledge base, ran the uh, uh, algorithm, there were 29 distinct uh, symptoms that we could not explain in their occurrences in the clinical records. And Idema, there were like 910 instances that we don't know, right? Uh, and all other, these are the top five uh, such uh, symptoms. And when when the edema is unexplained 910 scenarios, we found that these are the top uh, co-occurring uh, disorders with them. Right? So the idea, and then we uh, ran our algorithm. Uh, we, we are not going to ask all these uh, que uh, five questions. We will ask specific questions based on our knowledge about the entity. And the first iteration, uh, we asked 142 questions and he answered, okay, 105 that you generated were actually cut. So we add this knowledge to the knowledge base. So that will give enriched knowledge base. Now that, what, what, what does that 
do is that the, the documents will become solely explainable for some of those things. And once you add more knowledge, we ran this, the same experiment again and asked the second set of questions. And so you can see there's a drastic difference between the number of questions that you generate from first to second because the first itself gave me 105 uh, relationships. So we lost second iteration as like 29 questions and 20 were correct and then uh, we stopped at the third iteration because just it is not just generating enough questions to uh, the ask, right? So what is happening here is let's say that is your initial knowledge base and that is your initial clinical record. You ask questions based on that scenario and you get these relationships. Suddenly some of these things become explainable, you link them. And then in the second iteration again, you find, okay, there's a relationship between these two. And now it's, uh, now I, I can establish another relationship. Now this, the, the explainability of the clinical document based on my knowledge base goes uh, high. So that's what is quantified here. So the explainability of the knowledge base uh, goes high with respect to the data that I have. Uh, goes high with 60% on the first iteration and then 64% uh, uh, after the second. So this is the, uh, uh, now I can say the competency of the knowledge base goes high with respect to the knowledge base, uh, data set that I have. After the second iteration, it's 64% higher than the original, initial yes, knowledge initial. base? Yes, initial. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it is not from here to here. Okay. Yes. So in summary, what I have shown you is implicit information is not a rare scenario, it's occurring infrequently if you look at the right data sets, uh, which has uh, right uh, applications. And the knowledge about the uh, linguistic knowledge, world knowledge that are domain specific or cross domain knowledge plays a big role in linking, uh, extracting such implicit information. And we demonstrated uh, uh, this, uh, for, uh, we demonstrate the four components in realizing uh, extracting implicit information from different sources. And I showed you that we can use different knowledge sources to different applications and different uh, knowledge components uh, to model the entities. And then uh, how to detect such uh, implicit occurrences. And this is something we further investigated. And uh, others will be talking about that in next Tuesday. Uh, and then uh, we develop uh, information extraction techniques. Some of them are, are supervised, some of them are unsupervised, and some, some of them are semi-supervised. A uh, manner to extract the implicit information from the text. So, uh, to explicitly list down the contributions, uh, we identify and demonstrate the value of implicit information and we study the characteristics, like how they uh, manifest in the uh, text, and then demonstrate the value of different knowledge sources. Uh, and identify high level components that are needed and showed you how to realize those components in particular applications uh, to extract uh, uh, implicit information. Yeah, this come, uh, gives, uh, this is the end of my content on the uh, presentation. And this is a glance at uh, my six years at uh, Noises. Uh, and these are the publications. And I did a couple of internships. I started with ECDI and then I did two summer internships with IBM Watson and won a couple of awards and served DC committee in these uh, conferences, top tier conferences, and then contributed to proposals and I mentored a couple of students. Uh, okay, so all these things were possible only because of people around me. Uh, so starting from Dr. Seth, he gave me the opportunity to explore myself for this long from 2010 so thanks for that you can do it longer <laughs> <laughs> so and thank you very much for uh, the ecosystem that you have created for the graduate students uh, i don't think many graduate students uh, will get such ecosystem such uh, i know you uh, consciously work hard on create the dynamicity uh, and uh, uh, the way, uh, variety in our lab so that is very helpful to get different perspectives on the research. And not only on your technical things, we all know that he is very interested in our soft skills. Uh, that is something uh, uh, that I wouldn't have paid my attention unless you know he keeps on iterating on each group meeting. So <laughs> thanks, thanks for all these things. And then Dr. Prasad, uh, he's, 
he has super patient in whenever you go and explain something he 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 ask questions about very minor things so like you very detailed things so uh, you get uh, very interesting discussions with him so whenever you you we face a problem we normally go to start to discuss in detail so thanks for all the such uh, interesting discussions and dr rema although i have very short interaction with them with uh, dr rema he asked uh, questions that gave me the slight what's the difference between shift and inference some of those questions uh help me to think the research in detail and pablo i cannot stop thanking pablo uh, we started in 2013 our collaboration i am graduating in 2016 because of his energy actually he's uh, he's one of the person that i met the most energetic person i met uh, in my uh, graduate life and some of those things transferred to me to graduate in 2016 so <laughs> <laughs> so he he is the one actually uh, he he helped me a lot personally and professionally uh, to get this thing done and then mentors i my first mentor uh, is cory and we worked on uh, the first uh, the relationship paper and uh, he is the one who uh, gave me he taught me actually how to formulate the problems and how to identify sub problems and how to interpret the results i explicitly remember those discussions when i had bad results he always tried to find the optimistic uh, scenario for that he is master at uh, 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 interpreting the results and mina and kartik they were instrumental in, in my internships at ibm they made sure that i get the right problems to work uh, and right people to interact with so i uh, thank them all and then collaborators uh, deroy uh, i started with pedos project and i collaborated with deroy and then others i did that photo was taken on her defense day so this one Uh, and then so these are uh, i believe this captures so 6 years is too long period we have couple of generations in noises mm -hmm. so this is like 2011 and this is the latest one i guess so i might be missing some uh, between uh, so all these people help me uh, in different ways to spend time here without getting bored and all the coffee mates uh, and all the colleagues who helped me in different ways thank you all and then obviously the you can't do research without uh, research dollars so starting with tcdi they funded me and then uh, the fellowship that i won and then uh, finally i was funded with uh, context aware harassment detection uh, research uh, proposal that is going on in the noises lab so yeah thank you thank you for uh, attending my talk and listening and i am ready to get uh, ask uh, answer any questions now any questions yes sir thank you for your presentation so only one question uh, why you are working on tweet i mean extracting information in tweet so is there insufficient tweet tool for abbreviation or uh, at least spelling that you apply to extract such information so if you uh, tell something in 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 with abbreviations i can see that's uh, explicit so guardian i i saw guardians of guardians of galaxy gotg right so that's the explicit mention it's not implicit right you have the name it's a different form of So yeah, I did not work on the abbreviations and misspellings. No, I uh, I have not uh, treated that uh, differently. But I have like do the I have done the typical cleaning stuff. Like this cleaning will do like if you have uh, so the hashtags and the mentions uh, tend to mention in an uh, camel case man. So you can uh, do preposing on those things to identify which entity uh, those. So those kind of things that yeah. Right. Actually, I have a, a comment to sort of uh, sort of emphasize how your relation extraction research actually went. Mm -hmm. So initially, actually, the way we started was uh, we wanted to take uh, the background knowledge and use that to validate EMRs, and then we found that the EMRs were not getting validated. so there were some missing pieces what do you mean by validating emr 
they're basically checking for consistency whether the EMRs are complete. Mm. And we found that the diseases were not covering the symptom. And we thought that our uh, background knowledge should have detected those quote unquote errors. And then later we found that they were actually not errors in the EMR, but rather our uh, background knowledge that we had curated had, uh, had gaps. And so what we did was we took lots of EMRs and then statistically found uh, good hypothesis. Uh, if those connections between the symptoms and disorders were true, then the EMRs would be consistent. And by that uh, way, we were actually able to augment the background knowledge and correct that and fill the gap. So it was very interesting uh, uh, research where we started with something and took a U-turn and actually get, got some very interesting uh, results in the process. So Sujan, there's two kinds of information that you're extracting essentially, relationships and entities. Mm -hmm. Um, why do you choose to, to title the work then factual information extraction? Why do I say this are, these are factual information? Yeah, so, so, so in, the, in the title of your talk, mm -hmm. right, you talk about extracting factual information. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm wondering why you chose that particular. So in this information, you can express your opinion, ideas, and whatever in, in, uh, uh, in this manner. But some of these things are subject. Opinion, sentiment, those things are something. But if, if a tweet, whether a tweet has a gravity or not, it is it's a factual thing, right? So you say it has that. It's not subjective, right? If you say it's an NWX space movie, then there's no subjectivity, the subjectivity there. Just the space movie gap. And even in the, the, the relationships, I know these two things are uh, people might disagree on their based on their background knowledge, especially in the medical record. But if you get the, the majority acceptance between this, okay, many metaphoral is for hypertension, that is factual. Like you do that, uh, mm -hmm. that's the factual, that's not subject. So that's why I term uh, entities and relationships as factual. Okay. I'm going to ask you how you're going to use this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Pablo, yeah. Pablo, do you have any questions right now? Post that on the slideshow. Yeah, I do. Uh, can you move to slide 20 uh, so, so I can make a comment there? And meanwhile, I just wanted to apologize to Dr. Chef. It seems he oh, wanted to keep you for longer, but you blame me for uh, helping you to finish it uh, this year. So uh, first, I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, this but, is so I think I think here one thing that um, maybe you mentioned, but it didn't come off as strong to me, is how much effort is involved in sitting three experts to annotate this. Would you be able to quantify this somehow in, in, in hours or, uh, you know, can you give us any sense of how much work this is? Uh, I cannot give you in hours, but yeah, getting uh, three people, uh, we, we, uh, we try to access people from our medical uh, college and manage to get uh, three undergrads, uh, sorry, medical students to work on. Yeah, they took uh, a lot of time. I had to develop uh, different applications. Not that these annotated, they are not annotated in Excel sheets. They have, I developed a web application so that they can do it uh, much more easier way. So yeah, it, right. Yeah. So it how is, many weeks did you, did you guys use to complete? This? Oh, to get all this thing done, uh, uh, it took like two months to annotate them. Not that because they are not going to work on this thing uh, uh, continuously, right? So I had to after right. getting the data set, uh, I had to wait for like more than two months. To get all three right, people so, done. So that's a lot of work, right? And, yeah. and at the end, they still only agreed at 0.58, yes. which is like barely substantial agreement. So yes. this shows that this is a task that's difficult even for humans to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they and have then, a, uh, Go ahead. They have a, uh, some interesting examples here why this agreement is a law, uh, especially in a negated uh, scenarios. So let's say, I think I have an example. Uh, 
let's say it's just based on breathing as 20 to 40, right? So that's the, the normal breathing rate for uh, uh, some age group. So some people will say that, you know, it is not telling that it's the, the psychology, right? It's not telling that it's a negated mention. It's telling that it's just a reporting. That's the, so some people annotate that as, okay, this the patient does not have a shortness of breath. Some people just ignore, okay, it's not uh, worth annotating. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm rather highlighting how difficult this is for them yeah. an algorithm to do because if, if humans have trouble uh, doing this right, uh, then it's even harder for an algorithm. So in, in this slide 23, uh, so you're showing, uh, actually I think it was uh, 22. Yeah, so, so here you're showing how much uh, human effort you would need to then just throw a machine learning algorithm on that training data uh, to achieve good results. So your unsupervised approach, which requires no human effort to, to uh, pre-annotate. So you're using yeah. some human effort from the knowledge base. Yes. But, but that's, that's something that you build once and you reuse many times. Yes. Right? But the task-specific effort to label this data set, <clears throat> mm -hmm. so you're saying that it's even hard uh, so even after all the human effort, you train an algorithm, an SVM, which is a very competitive algorithm, uh, and it has trouble beating your unsupervised baseline, right? Yes. Uh, and also, uh, when you use what you build, not as an unsupervised approach, but you use it as a novel feature mm -hmm. uh, to a, a supervised algorithm, then uh, it becomes even better. Yes. Right? So, so that, that's a point that I think uh, I, I wanted to state and see if you agree with me because I think it uh, you, you you downplayed a little bit your contribution here. Okay. Yeah. So basically, this says you know the value that we can calculate is capture the semantics and it helps to uh, improve the supervised solution in two ways to reduce the label data or to improve the results. Cool. Uh, then on slide uh, 37, I was curious if you had an estimate of the size of the entity model network that comes out because you did some pruning, and I, I and I assume that's to control a little bit the complexity of the task, right? Uh -huh. uh, so, so what is the size of what you ended up with, the number of nodes or edges or any stats that you have? Hmm. No, I don't have the uh, the numbers right now. But, uh, do you how do, do you know how much memory you needed to use, or or how uh, the size of the files and the, the disk, or any like, or at least a subjective evaluation? Is this really really large, or is that something very manageable that, that could run in a, in a small device or something? Mm -hmm. No, no. Actually, I don't have uh, those numbers, but yeah, it's uh, something that I can I can hit. Okay. Cool. You know, Pablo um, made some uh, you know wonderful observations, especially the prior uh, point that he made about SVM and uh, other things. But I want to add um, and the challenges in annotation that he brought out. Uh, some of you, if you are in this field, uh, should have and probably would have seen the uh, talks that Laura Arayo is being talk, giving on the problem with annotation. It is well worth uh, looking at. Um, but a, an interesting thing here is that um, you see today a lot of work gets done by teamwork. Like in physics, for example, there are papers with 150 publications, and there's a discussion out there that no single person even understands the whole paper. Right? I think um, things increasingly uh, we have relied entirely too much on annotators, human annotators. It's like putting the humans, uh, you know. Uh, as the gold standard, as the references that they, that human um, has hundred uh, percent knowledge or what it takes to give you the best annotation, you you take and use your own. Of course, we understood that uh, when internal annotator agreement is uh, low, uh, that is not the case. But there is one more thing that is happening: is that that uh, inherently, the task that we are doing, like annotating this kind of text, um, there is very often. Uh, no single person with uh, sufficient knowledge to, let's say, annotate everything in that document. Suppose I have an EMR where um, the patient has been seen both by GI specialist and uh, a cardiovascular specialist uh, in, the, in the hospital. 
um, and you take a fellow that comes from one or the other discipline, there is no guarantee that uh, that fellow who is doing the notation would be able to notate everything from both the thai, uh, you know, both the specialties, especially, uh, you know, with respect to implicit entities where he would not even have heard of, or you know, that in, the, in his discipline they would not be describing the things in this indirect way. So the interesting thing is that um, in future, and and and, and then uh, contrast that with the fact that a lot of knowledge bases are developed by afford by you know involving multiple people. <coughs> In multiple sources, you start from multiple sources, you evolve over the period of time, you would have multiple people curating and, you know, dev you know, managing that. So potentially knowledge base has a number of things that the humans won't have, the human annotators won't have. So in future, in this more complex task, uh, we need to see annotation uh, not only as something that is benchmarked with human annotation, but one that is a mix of the two. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you convince the community, you know. But I think the community uh, that you know primarily relies on human annotation is on the wrong thing. Now you can you can create a large committee to do annotations, and in the benchmark creation, you can involve many people with many expertise to do that, and you can do a better job. But the in-house annotation we take by having giving one person to say annotate these things that comes with a lot of problems. Sorry, that's, a, that's a good point. I think in the in the past, people have done uh, re-annotation studies where mm -hmm. after you do the initial individual annotation, you aggregate everything that everybody annotated plus what the systems are annotating, and then you make everybody look at it again. But I think that even in this case, people might still disagree and want to capture the disagreement somehow, so that um, there might be a, some, some research to be done in, in that. So, general area. Um, but I had one, one last question as well for Sujan, yeah. and that's slide 55. Um, it's where you're talking about you, the relationships that you discover mm -hmm. um, for, the, for the implicit. And I think somehow also relating to the implicit uh, entities that you're extracting, I think um, I, I'm now thinking about, you know, let's, now you've done all this work, right? So we're able to extract these, uh, these implicit relationships and uh, how would this impact other tasks in the future? And this just, just kind of makes me think that knowledge-based completion in general should, should be, I guess my question to you is, do you think mm -hmm. that this technique that you described here, focusing on extracting implicit relationships, is something that could become also a general Knowledge based completion, and not, I'm not suggesting you do this by the yeah. way in your, yeah. in your thesis. I'm just saying, right, the, the, the impact that you might have in the future. Do you think that this also impact could this be used as a knowledge based completion technique in general? Like, oh, first thing you do is uh, you look at the, the symptoms and the disorders, and then you rank them by how common they are, then you formulate these questions in a particular way because you seem to have pretty good. Uh, uh, answers for the, the percentages in the first, second, and third iterations here, yeah. right? So, yeah. like, do you think this could also become something in the knowledge-based completion? Yeah, so, uh, I'll answer that question in little detail. Uh, uh, so, if you talk about generic knowledge bases, right? Uh, DBpedia, it's not something that we can apply here. Here, if you notice, we use uh, domain semantics. Like we know in a clinical document, these uh, symptoms and disorders should be there. That's the first assumption. That is not assumption that you can make across the data sets, right? So we use, we use the, the uh, domain semantics. Well, let's say people and companies. Could you discover which people are CEOs mm -hmm. or which companies, which ones are founders? Could you do something like that? Uh, yeah, I think uh, like let's say uh, people in companies like. If you have prior knowledge about their uh, uh, the designation and what kind of work they do, this can be uh, used to figure out, okay, these are the best people that he might interact with. So that kind of background knowledge that you can use rather than saying that, okay, I have 500 people and uh, I'm, I want to find out uh, which guy interact with which. So you will, you will ask one in uh, 499 questions. So, uh, not uh, not doing that, but if you have more background knowledge about this, uh, the guy that you are considered, 
then uh, yeah, I think you can filter out uh, uh, from the uh, that 419 which are the most possible uh, 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 things. But uh, I see, I see. Like uh, you need to you uh, the semantics of the domain uh, can be different. Here we use that uh, okay, these things should be related, but there are maybe the different semantics about the, the person and his personal life uh, makes sense to use. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I do. Uh, how come there are not many questions? I expect you guys to be more. Really? Then I have another one. Yeah. Slide <laughs> <laughs> slide thirty eight. Uh, did you train and test on the same data? Thirty eight. Correct. Three eight. Uh huh. Did I, uh, no, so, this, yeah. these are cross-validated data. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yes. The disorders that are mentioned, are all the symptoms of the cardiac disorder or you may have side effects? Yeah. I, I so, mean, is it uh, also the consequence of taking the drug or only the symptom of the Yeah, so yeah, there, there can be multiple uh, different types of relationship between the entity, right? Uh, so, right, you can say, but, uh, so you are taking a uh, drug for a particular disease or you are taking a drug because side effect of another disease, right? Another uh, drug. Right? That's what uh, you are talking about, right? Yeah, because uh, you are using coordinates, yeah. so I want to know whether uh, they only explain about the symptoms of the disease of the patient, or it is also the consequence of taking the drug. Because so, yeah, in the, in, in, in the clinical record itself, yeah, yeah. there can be bo both, right? But there is no way to distinguish between unless you know that uh, uh, this is a side effect of that drug, that is why this drug is taken, right? So, as at the end, right, I still left with another 800 some relationship that I could not identify. So, some of those things may be those things just because that we, we don't have that complex relationships captured in our <coughs> knowledge. So, we can resolve such relationships. So, 800 some, set, some subset of maybe uh, the relationship that you are. See, one of the issues that we have run into is that if the same symptom is associated with two different diseases yes. or the same drug is associated with two different diseases, then if we find one which may be incorrect, we will still give it a pass because in that sense it is doing only statistical stuff. Yeah. yeah, I have explicitly list down uh, the limitations of this work. Uh, might affect that 800 whatever odd number that I mean, right? So, what were the reasons for those things? That uh, there were three reasons that I found. In fact, another thing that uh, that we didn't explicitly mention is the goal was to bring in uh, human in the loop, and his approach will generate promising hypotheses that are going to be uh, verified by the human before the knowledge base is uh, changed. So this is how we can kind of minimize the effort uh, needed by, by humans. So, so it's a nice combination of using uh, data-driven techniques uh, to improve uh, curated uh, knowledge. And this is a step in that direction. Uh, my concern is maybe the, some, some symptoms are telling the elephant from medical report that you have to take the symptoms of the patient because some patients have taken the other one. And right. And so those. Stopping taking that drug is the, yeah. Right. So right. Right now, those are probably not mm -hmm. going to be handled yeah. properly. Yeah. 